And let me just put a plug in for the Victory Garden program before you get started, Erin. So um, the University of Florida IFAS is hosting the Victory Garden program. And this is a program that you can learn more about vegetable gardening. We have online modules and um, we do the webinar series like you're attending today. And so I'll be putting that link into the chat box in just a minute. And today's um, session is going to be recorded. And so um, it will be available. We usually upload them on Friday. And you can watch um, the recording and share that with your friend. It will be free and open to the public on YouTube. And then keep posted for some other exciting workshops we're having um, later this month. Awesome. Thanks, Tia. All right, so let's let's go ahead and get started. We've uh, it's about 11:05, and um, I know people will continue to join us, and that's fine. Um, but Tia will post, like she said, in the chat box for everyone, the where you can find the recording of this. Um, also, if you're not already a member of our Victory Garden community, um, she'll post where uh, you can join as well. So, uh, with that, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and close my chat box. And uh, we met Tia. Uh, she is the agent in Orlando, um, and then the horticulture agent in Orlando. And then Maxine Hunter is also on. Uh, she's also a horticulture agent in Marion County. Um, and so they will be assisting me today, kind of monitoring the chat box for us when you guys have questions. So my name is Erin Harlow, um, and I'm the horticulture agent here in Columbia County, uh, which is Lake City area or North Florida. Uh, for those of you who may not be from this area. And we again are, are part of the Victory Garden, um, Victory 2020 Garden community. Uh, we are some of the few agents that, that host this group. Um, and so if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Um, I think this is class number 22 for us, uh, something like that. So we do have some more planned for the, the fall as we kind of restart our gardens, um, but we're excited to bring you this topic today, which is seed starting for your fall garden. Um, and like we said, if you have any questions, we'll put those in the chat. I do have some, um, if I can get my mouse to work here. There it goes. Okay, so we have some housekeeping. Um, we ask that you do keep your video off during the presentation. It just helps with the quality for everyone. Um, and then we do ask that you also mute yourself throughout the presentation um, and we will assist that if it accidentally gets turned on. If you do have a question, please find that chat box to ask those questions. We'll actually hold them till the very end uh, and then um, ask those all at the end. So today I've kind of broken this up into three different areas. I really kind of wanted to, wanted to demystify the process um, of getting seeds started. Okay, so the first part I'm gonna talk about is prepping. And I actually spend a lot of time in this section because it is so important. Um, and we'll talk about equipment and materials, um, timing and planning, and then seed care. We'll also go over part two, which is planting. Uh, that's, that's not too difficult. And then part three, um, we call it the parenting section because that's really where we're taking care of our, our little seeds. Um, we'll talk about water, fertilization, light, transplanting, that sort of thing. And if in the chat, I'm gonna ask you guys a question. If you guys would, go ahead and put in the chat, um, are you really doing your, your seeds uh, indoors or are you starting them direct so outdoors? So if you would go ahead and put that in the chat for me. Ooh, there it goes. All right. Looks like we've got a little bit of both. Okay, so today I'm um, going to be talking a lot about indoors, but then I'm also gonna throw in some outdoors for those of you who are um, working on kind of uh, direct sow. So a lot of this will be focused on uh, putting things in trays and then moving it. So let's start with prepping first. Um, and then uh, what we're gonna go over today is seeds, soils, We'll talk about the pots, timing, and then breaking dormancy. So while we move through this, what I want you to think about um, is what does the seed need? Okay, and, and we're going to talk about this throughout this whole presentation. 
But I want you to remember these things. Um, we're going to talk about the light conditions because I feel like a lot of people struggle with where do I put my seeds um, and what light conditions do I need. Um, I will will say myself included in the past. Um, each house is different. You have to kind of figure out where the best place is. Okay, um, we'll talk about soil moisture because the seeds need that. They of course need air and then temperature. So again, as we move through today, remember all of these things as we kind of talk about these. So first, let's talk about what type of seeds you want to purchase, okay, or use in your garden. And I wanted to start with this because I felt like this was really important um, as we select seeds. Uh, and then there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. So I'm going to start with what are open pollinated seeds, okay, or plants. So open pollinated is means that these plants or flowers are going to be pollinated by nature. And that means uh, insects, uh, could be wind, birds, could be humans, okay, but it's going to be through nature. Uh, and the seeds can be saved if they're crossed with the same variety. So if we have some seed savers out there, or if somebody wants to keep seeds, uh, maybe they're just kind of getting into it, uh, this is important for you, okay? But they have to be the same variety. Um, so if you have three different types of cucumbers, uh, you want to make sure that, that there's distances that they have to be apart. So you don't want the cross variety, okay? If they're heirloom seeds, typically, and the definition can change a little bit, but typically we're considering um, pre-World War II heirloom seeds, right? And these are seeds that are passed down. Usually they're regional or special to an area. They are open pollinated, okay? And these seeds are, can be saved because they are um, open pollinated. But again, they're usually, um, they've become acclimated to an area and so um, they're being passed down. Now hybrid is, is very confused with GMO a lot. And so I wanted to make sure we understand those two. Um, because hybrid is what a lot of us grow. Um, and hybrids of uh, seeds or plants mean that there is human intervention to cross two specific plants to achieve desired traits. So we're taking a mom plant and a dad plant and we're putting them together and we're being very methodical about which plants we're choosing. And we wanna make sure that we're getting the same uh, seed. So they're using the same um, two uh, varieties, okay, to get those seeds. So these uh, seeds are true to type, and sometimes you might see them, um, if you're reading through like a seed magazine, you might see them called an F1 generation, because that's the first generation after the cross. And the reason that we purchase these seeds every year is because if you grow out the seeds from that F1 uh, you might get something that looks a little bit more like mom. You might get something that looks like dad. You might get something that's kind of in between. Um, so it's not, a, it's not uh, gonna be something that you can replicate every year. So we, again, we, we uh, tend to purchase those. They're not GMO seeds though. So, and, and the chances of you purchasing a genetically modified seed is almost zilch, um, unless you're a farmer because there's a lot of paperwork involved. Um, and so they sign uh, basically agreements or contracts with companies that they will not, um, that they have to repurchase their seeds every year. And these seeds are genetically modified. And so they have had their DNA artificially altered in a laboratory. So you'll see a lot of seed magazines will say, you know, um, no GMOs uh, seeds sold. Well, that's because typically they're not gonna be selling to a, a homeowner, okay? So you're purchasing hybrid or heirloom, and it's completely up to you um, and, and your kind of your goals as to what seeds you want to choose. So some other considerations um, that we talk about is treated versus non-treated seeds. So uh, you'll, if, again, if you're looking through seed magazines or if um, you, know, you get them online or um, Maybe you go to your local box store, okay? Uh, you'll notice it might say treated. Um, usually these are kind of a reddish color or a, a blue color. Um, and so they've been treated with fungicide. And that fungicide is meant to help that seed when you plant it. Um, usually it's against things like pythium or damping off. So it just helps the seed germinate. But 
it's important for us to know is it treated or non-treated um, because you want to make sure if they're treated that you wear gloves. Um, so we do recommend it. It is a, a pesticide. Um, make sure that you're wearing your, you know, protective equipment while you're working with the seeds. But it just ups your chances for success um, if maybe you live in an area that, that you need that. Okay. Uh, the other thing I want you guys to be aware of is disease resistance. Uh, and the, there's codes. So I put a photo on here in the upper right hand corner. Uh, and this one happens to be from Johnny Seeds. Um, but typically the code lists are very long. Sorry, my light goes out. Um, the code list is very long. And so it depends on the, the fungus um, and the plant. So you can see here uh, just a couple, uh, if the seed label has an A on it, uh, that would be anthracnose. And so this is resistance to. That doesn't necessarily mean that the plant is, uh, or the seed is treated for anything. It just means that plant can tolerate um, some resistance to that disease. And so they might say they have high resistance or intermediate resistance. So again, if you've had a, a fungal problem go through your garden, the next year, you, maybe you want to look for seeds that um, you know, have these particular traits. Now, pelleted seeds are another thing that um, people get confused with. So I put a picture of pelleted seeds. Those are actually carrots right there. Um, and so what they're coated with is, is like a clay. And it really just helps if you use a machine, okay? Because some of these seeds are really, really small. Um, you'll see lettuce, pelleted, you'll see carrots, um, and there's several others. I use pelleted seeds when I work with um, special groups. So if I work with kids a lot, I might use pelleted seeds. It's kind of easier for them to pick up. Um, we work with some adults with disabilities at the um, local VA hospital in their garden. And so I typically use pelleted seeds for them um, when we're doing their therapy. Because again, it's a little bit easier for people to handle, um, but that's, that's all, they're, they're just coated in clay. You might see something called seed tape. I'll be honest, I've never used it, um, but it's some, certainly something you can use. Um, you can make yourself if you want, uh, if you uh, work with youth. But it's uh, basically, they, you can see it there as a picture. They take the tape or the, the um, it's kind of like a coffee filter, is what it is, or toilet paper thickness, and they put seeds in there, and it's so that they're evenly spaced. And so if you're, um, again, somebody that likes nice, neat rows, that might be an option for you. And then you might see um, seeds that are called PVP or plant variety protected. And these are seeds that are specific to a company. So again, if it's like Johnny seeds, okay, um, they may have the rights to a certain uh, hybrid seed. And that right, those rights are, they last for 20 years. And it's basically like a patented plant. Um, if you do purchase those seeds, uh, you're basically agreeing that you won't um, sell the seeds so you can't, um, you know, save them and sell them uh, as something else or as that plant. Um, and then they, they have the rights to that. So they're the only ones selling it as well. And again, that lasts for 20 years. So just a few things that you may um, come across that I wanted you to be aware of. All right, so let's talk about where to get your seeds. Um, I have a photo here. One of my favorite places is your seed library if you have one. Um, we are lucky if you're in Columbia County uh, or Alachua County or Suwannee County. I know all three of those places have a seed library. And so you, every month you can use your library card and you can go and get five little packs of seeds. Um, they have flowers and vegetables. So check out your local library and see if you have a seed library. Okay. Uh, you can also order, of course, from box stores or um, order online. Uh, seed swap groups and seed saver groups are great places. Um, what about the grocery store? Okay, we hear that a lot can I use seeds from the grocery store? Technically, you can, okay? But remember, most of our produce is going to be hybrids because they're grown for higher yields. So you may not get um, a plant that is quite uh, what you expect, or the fruit might not be quite what you expect. And then do seeds go bad? Okay, uh, it depends really on how they're stored. So um, you can see these happen to be from 2017. Um, we're planting them and we're getting almost 100% germination rate right now. Uh, and so there's, they, these were stored properly. Um, you know, I don't keep them, try not to keep your seeds, you know, in your hot car. Um, I usually keep mine in a refrigerator uh, if I'm going to keep them. So store them properly and, and uh, they'll last for quite a few years.
All right, so let's talk about soil. Um, and we're gonna talk about first, uh, if you're planting indoor or in trays. So I really want you guys to look for light and fluffy soil. And it really does make a difference when we're planting our seeds, um, what we started in. Because I want you to be the most successful um, as possible. And so I have found um, that soil for seed starting uh, I find is is really it's worth the um, little bit extra drive or to find what I want um, or time or money. Okay, you can make your own. That's fine. And I show here is a, a kind of a breakdown of the um, what's in most seed starting mixes. So normally it's some kind of peat moss, okay, uh, vermiculite and fine perlite. And again, those are all natural products, um, and you can find them separately and then mix uh, together if you choose. I put three on here, um, and I'm certainly not promoting one over another. Uh, there's lots of choices, um, but just make sure you, you know, try it and see how successful you are. Most of these should have the same mix uh, that I've shown here. And, and this breakdown actually is um, the SunGrow propagation mix, which if I can find it, that's what I get at my local um, farm center. That's what I use. And I'll show you a picture uh, in a minute what it looks like but it's very, very light and very, very fluffy. These are also sterile, which is important when you're starting seeds. Okay? I don't typically use um, my compost if I'm starting in trays. Now, if I'm starting outdoors, that's a little bit different. So if you're doing bed prep in the garden and you're direct sowing your seeds, um, obviously we're not using sterile material, okay? Um, but I do wanna make sure particularly if you're in Florida, uh, if you're in our area, it's really, really sandy. We don't have organic matter. So you are gonna wanna add some compost um, to your area uh, or organic matter. And I don't really care, you know, I've listed a couple methods here. I don't care if you're using a no-till method, uh, conventional till, the double dig uh, or intensive method, or if you're using raised beds, okay? Um, the idea is, is you want a nice, light soil and that should be nice and loose um, and then again if you can add that compost or organic matter that increases the microbes it increases that uh, soil water moisture uh, holding capability um, and then get your soil tested if you are working outdoors uh, we really are aiming for you know six six and a half somewhere in there uh, if you are um, again in our area we do soil testing for free check with your local extension office some of them will provide a pH test for free. Some of them you have to mail off to um, say Gainesville or, or your university. Um, but that gives you an idea of kind of what you're working with. All right, now let's talk about the different types of containers um, and does it make a difference? I will tell you what I use and then what I've seen other people use. Um, and again, there's, there's really no wrong way to do this. Uh, Soil is a huge, huge part of it though, okay? But what you put it in, um, we'll talk about cleaning it in a minute, but make sure they're clean. So this upper picture here where you've got the, um, the little trays with the, the lid and then the, um, the tray on the bottom that has no holes, that's what I typically start my seeds in. And I've done it every single way. Um, but I will tell you, I prefer this method. I have the most success with this method. Um, and so, I've uh, you know, spent a little bit extra money at the beginning to get a lid in the, like I said, the tray without holes. Um, now you can use a 72 cell, which is, um, I don't have a picture of a 72 cell, but um, you can see that would be just the number of cells, okay? So some are a little bigger. And then for instance, down here in the left corner, uh, that's a 200 cell tray. Those are gonna be obviously much smaller space for your seedling to grow in. So I would have to up pot usually quicker than if I was using a little bit larger uh, seed tray. So keep that in mind, what you wanna start with. Um, and you certainly can start it in pots, okay? Um, the other thing that people will do, which is, is perfectly fine, is they'll take this tray without holes in the middle here and they'll just put soil in that. And so they don't actually use the pots and then they'll make little rows uh, and do it that way and then scoop them out when they're ready. That's fine as well. Um, I, again, typically don't do it that way. It kind of depends on what I'm growing um, and how close I want the plants to end up. 
So like I said, I use the method on the top. Um, I will say though, I keep my seeds um, indoors. If I'm gonna use them outside, okay, because I water from the bottom, so I don't want holes. If I'm gonna keep them outside, like on my patio um, or my deck, which is not covered, then I might go with something like this tray that doesn't have any holes in it. And that's so that my seedlings don't drown because it's constantly raining where I am. Um, and so I also have, um, you'll see my little helpers in a little bit, but I have little helpers um, that like to water. And so uh, my plants can drown really quickly. So in that case, I would use uh, a tray without holes, but um, just know that that's, that soil dries out fairly quickly. Um, so you're gonna have to check it more often, okay? So can you re reuse your pots? Absolutely, okay? Uh, but I do recommend that you um, disinfect them. So I typically will rinse mine off, kind of get all the debris off. Then I will put it in a bleach solution. So it's one part bleach to nine parts water. Uh, I usually do this in a, um, like a large uh, trash can, or um, I've been known to do it in my kid's little swimming pool. That works really well. It usually needs to be bleached anyway. Um, and it's nice and long so I can, can put trays in there. Um, but soak it for about 10 minutes and then rinse it and let them air dry. And that way you're just getting rid of diseases, okay? But feel free to, re to reuse your pots, um, you know, whether you're upcycling something or, um, you know, using clay pots or you're using the trays that I showed you. And then if you want, need more information, I've got all the links here for you guys. Okay. So let's talk about breaking dormancy. Um, and so when we have seeds, a lot of times, you know, we'll help you hear people say, well, I didn't have really good luck um, getting okra, for instance, to germinate. Um, and so there's some things we can do. Uh, and usually it's a little bit less with vegetables, but I do want to, it's worth mentioning. Okay. So, um, and of course, some of these things you may not be planting now because we're going into winter, but I wanted to give you an overview, you know, beans, um, but peas, you, you might be doing your, um, your sugar snap peas, okay? So those I usually soak, uh, and, and uh, usually it's 12 hours to 24 hours is what I do, um, and then that just helps them germinate and break that, that seed coating um, a little bit better. You can soak your okra as well, but they're really kind of hard, okay? Um, if you read the research paper here at the bottom, it was, it's pretty fascinating. Um, but they, they did soak their okra, but it actually delayed the germination by several days. Um, so that was kind of interesting. They found that sulfuric acid at 80% at three minutes, um, so it's an, we call it acid scarification, okay? Uh, that gave them the best results for their okra. So they had like a 96% germination rate after that. Sometimes some of your seeds, you'll do mechanical scarification. Um, and I don't usually do this with my vegetable seeds, but some of my other flowering plants I will. Um, I have been known to throw them in a blender. Um, we will use uh, little files, like nail files, do that, or nail, nail nippers, clippers. I will uh, just barely clip the seed, um, particularly if, you, if it's something like a, like a canna lily that's very dense or hard. Um, so there's a lot of different mechanical scarification, um, and then of course, uh, acid scarification as well. Sometimes temperature is important, and I'll talk about in a second. And then light or darkness can be very important. So uh, seeds that need light to germinate include lettuce, uh, savory, and snapdragons. So think about if you've ever worked with lettuce or snapdragons, those seeds are so tiny. And so you really just put them right on the surface of your trays or wherever you're planting them, and then either don't cover them or, or barely cover them, okay? Um, some of these will germinate with just a little bit of soil cover. Uh, and those include the ones you see here, the broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower. Um, so those I typically will put just a little bit of soil uh, and I make sure it's a moist soil, okay? And so I've got some charts here, um, you know, not to get too into this, but, but there's a light and a dark, okay? And so I pulled out, you can see the vegetables I pulled out here. These are ones that do require some light or dark in order to germinate. Um, and so break that dormancy is what they're doing. So capsicum is peppers, uh, docus is carrots, we've got lettuce, um, and so those all require light. However, uh, they, if you notice lettuce here, 
if they've got a dry storage period, meaning you, you, if you collect them or usually you get them in a seed package, that's a long enough dry storage period that they, that light dormancy is actually broken. So you don't have to worry about the light dormancy if you pick up dry um, seeds. Now, say you've collected them yourself. This is where we get into some of the seed saving stuff. They may have to store these for a certain amount of time or make sure they're in light or dark in order to get that process for them to germinate um, started. So again, here's um, for dry storage. Now dry storage is weeks to months. Okay, uh, again, I've pulled out the um, vegetables here. Uh, so we've got from left to right, we've got the brassicas, um, which are like your, your collards, uh, broccolis, uh, cabbage. We've got peppers, cucumbers, carrots, lettuce, um, tomatoes, which are also, they've now moved over to solanum, um, which is uh, tomatoes and eggplants. So again, dry storage. So if you take it from a grocery store, for instance, you might have to let it sit and dry out before it will germinate. So that's that again, this is just going into the little bit more advanced of, of uh, why maybe your seeds aren't germinating. Okay. And you can check out that research paper there if you'd like. One thing though that is really important that I think a lot of us forget about is soil temperature requirements. So these are for our um, you know, germination. And so what we've got here, uh, this is from um, one of our extension partners. And so there's a full list. So you can actually check out the full list. We'll make sure you guys get these PowerPoints. Um, and so, or take a picture with your phone. Uh, you can see here, uh, so for instance, eggplants. I germinated eggplants um, in the, for my spring garden, okay? Uh, and also peppers. And I, on, on the seed package, it very specifically says, you know, these need to be kept or germinate at a certain temperature. And then once they germinate, the soil temperature needs to change. And so to get the highest, um, you know, maximum germination, I really wanted to pay attention to that. And I was, of course, right now, it's not a problem because it's warm outside. So our temperatures are pretty high. Um, you know, I, I will never get to 32 degrees soil temperature in North Florida or at least not for very long, okay? Um, but I'm, I can get to 85, no problem, okay? We're usually at 65 in the ground um, in March, April, somewhere in there, so during the winter periods. Uh, but this is optimum range. So again, I'm in, say I was in the spring when I was trying to do my peppers, um, and I really wanted to get good germination. Uh, it was cold, it was my um, garage, okay? So I wanted to make sure that I got good germination. So I use a seedling heat mat. Um, and so this time of year, I don't really need to worry about it. I will check my soil temperatures if I'm really trying to get good germination rates. But um, I do use a seedling heat mat for specific things, my eggplants and my peppers being two of them. Um, and it just, just will um, quicken up that pace. One, um, chart I did not put on here, I don't think, let me check. No, one chart I did not put on here for you guys, but it is in this document here, is based on soil temperatures, it will show you um, how fast the seed germinates. And so um, like tomatoes, for instance, when they're at a certain temperature for soil, you know, it might germinate in four days, but you go up five degrees and it takes 10 or 12 days. So some of these seeds are a ridiculously long time if they're at the wrong soil temperature. So we're sitting here waiting for these seeds to germinate and really all we needed to do was, was adjust our, um, our soil temperatures. Uh, so this kind of helps us um, decide to when to plant, uh, but think about, we'll talk about timing um, right now actually. For, for Florida, um, you know, we, we have our vegetable garden guide, which is an EDIS publication. Uh, and I reference it quite a bit. Uh, so if you have not looked at this guide, I highly recommend that you do because they break it down by North, Central and South Florida and then the vegetables. And it kind of gives you a planting date for outdoors. So what does that mean for us though, right? So if we're planting outdoors, say I wanted to transplant my arugula, okay? It does have a transplantability of a one so it should technically transplant, although I've, I will say I've never tried transplanting arugula. Um, but it says that I can transplant it in September. 
well, that's great, except if I start my seeds now, okay, um, obviously I'm waiting four to six weeks, which is okay for arugula because it's still September through March. But if there's a very short window and I want to transplant now, I needed to start my seeds four to six weeks ago. Um, and so this is where a lot of us get off our schedules a little bit. Um, and I find Florida is a little bit difficult because, you know, if I wanted to plant, um, say I wanted to plant cabbage and I want to go out there and plant my cabbage now, okay, I certainly could if I had transplants, but I would have had to start those four to six weeks ago. And I don't know about your house, but my house has been really, really hot. Could you imagine trying to grow little cabbages? I mean, they would have been eaten by every caterpillar known to man in my garden. And it's so hot outside, they probably would have bolted by the time I got to my four weeks. So I, I will honestly say I, I, I like these charts, but I tend to take them with a, um, as a guidance, okay? I use them as a guide and I say, okay, what's going on in my house? Um, will I be able to, to maintain these, these little things if I start them in you know, the end of July? Which according to a lot of these charts is when I should start my seeds in North Florida. I, I don't ever start my seeds in July, I'll be honest. I almost always start them at the end of August into the middle of September, like now, okay? Um, and it works, works fine. So, we, you know, we see a lot of our infographics and things that have some of this data on there, but that's why they say we can do that. You can, technically. Um, here's another chart I wanted to share with you. This is an app, okay? Um, for those of you people that like to do online computer things, there's many, many out there. I just happened to be on Johnny's Seeds um, and saw theirs, and so I thought I'd share it with you. Um, certainly not promoting theirs over another, um, but, but you can try it. So I entered in, I went, you had to find your frost date. So here in my zip code, um, my frost date is November 21st. Um, so I put in my frost date at the top there, and then it automatically generates dates for me, okay? And so again, these are um, when I should plant outside. So it says, you see beets the first row there, DS is direct sow. So it says I can direct sow my beets today would be a good day, okay? Um, it's still hot outside, but it, they, they should come up um, if, I, if my beds were ready, which they're not, but they, they will be soon. <laughs> um, so broccoli transplant, 829. Well, I'm a little behind, but that's transplant date. So again, uh, if I wanted to transplant my broccoli on 829, I would have had to have started them four weeks before that. Make sense? So I'm not, I'm not up to babying my plants that much, so I just wait and I start mine. I just started mine a couple weeks ago. Um, they're about two weeks old, so uh, they'll be ready to go on the ground in, in a, you know, two, two, three weeks. And, uh, and that tends to work just fine for me. I, I usually don't have any problems. But this just gives me guides, okay? Um, and it may depend on the year. We might get an early uh, frost, and then I'll just cover my plants if that's the case. Okay, so that's for um, our prepping. Let's actually talk about planting, okay? So this is pretty easy, um, not a very long section. Okay, we're gonna talk about how to and then labeling. All right, so there's that picture of that soil that I mentioned. And I, I do, I love this, this soil, I'll be honest. It's just so light and fluffy. Um, what you're looking at here though is I've already moistened it. So I already put water in it. So if you are gonna plant in trays, make sure you moisten your soil beforehand, okay? So I always, I use a wheelbarrow or bucket, whatever I'm, I'm doing, and then I actually dump it on my trays and then I just spread it out. And actually, well, I will pick up my tray and drop it once, so it kind of, um, while we need air space for our seeds to grow, it just helps me kind of kind of settle the soil a little bit so that it's, it compacts just a, just a little bit. Um, and it little, it's a little bit easier for me to make the little indents for my seeds. If you're planting in the ground, um, go ahead and prep your soil, make sure it's moist, right? You've already put your compost in it uh, or whatever you're using. I, I would not recommend taking this soil and putting it into my seed bed in the garden, okay? Um, you just really don't, I would, I, you don't need that, okay? So, but make sure you've got a nice soil uh, that is moist and you've got that organic matter there, then go ahead and, and make your rows for your seeds. Now, when we're planting, um, 
This is my helper, okay? She does almost all of my planting for me. Um, but you wanna make sure that you do the holes about two to three times deeper than the seed. So if it's a really small seed, you don't want a very deep hole um, because it will take too long or it won't get enough light for it to germinate. Um, now, if it's a large seed, you know, you may be going half an inch deep. So you have to look at the seed and then check the label as well. They'll usually tell you. Um, I, you can kind of see this picture here. I will take a pencil is what I use and I will just poke a little hole where the seed is gonna go. And I do the entire tray or whatever I'm planting and fill it with seeds and then I cover it back up in case I forget where I am um, or if I stop. That way it kind of helps me. Once I put the seeds in there, I will lightly cover them um, and I just kind of take my finger and spread over the soil, okay? Uh, and then don't forget to label. Uh, and I use old blinds. Uh, that's what a lot of people will, will reuse. Uh, you can use anything you want. If you use something like a blind though, make sure you write on it with a pencil. Okay, not a permanent marker, because permanent marker will wash off when it gets wet. Pencil will not. So if you buy the plant tags, use a pencil, okay? Um, but you can use anything to label. I will tell you a little trick though, if you're doing an entire tray, <laughs> one mistake I made last year, um, and I didn't think about this, and this is a, a rookie mistake, I can't believe I did this, but I just took painter's tape and I had labeled all of my trays, my, my trays that are, um, they're sitting in, okay? Because I was doing 72 at once. Well, halfway through the, um, when I was growing my seedlings, I needed to switch the trays out because some of them had holes and some did not. So I wanted everybody to be in trays with holes. Um, and so I'd switched them out. Well, by doing that, I switched the names of the plants and I was growing about five different varieties of tomatoes. <laughs> um, so by the end, I had to refigure out which ones were you know, Juliet's and which ones were Matt's wild cherries and which ones were this and that and this. So put the tag in the actual little tray. Um, and if you're doing, these break apart. So depending on your container, make sure you're labeling each section. Same thing for outside, uh, make sure you're labeling where you put your seeds. Um, if you have little helpers, um, luckily my kids don't move the tags anymore, but when they were little, they would move the tags around. So uh, if I'm outside, I actually will draw a picture of my garden as well and label where I put things because I wanna know if the spinach came up versus the radishes and, and you know, where things are at. Um, and then I put the tray, you can see the lid here that we put on there. So for, for planting, that's, that's pretty much it. Okay, we're gonna go into parenting now. Um, and so let's talk about location because location, 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 like everybody says. Um, you know, you've got your seeds, five days later, they've started to sprout and you're super excited. Um, but where do you keep them? Okay, uh, this is, this really can make or break you because you've put a lot of effort into them so far. And you want to make sure um, that they're in a sunny spot. But the problem is, is what we perceive as sunny may not be enough light for, for your plants. So patios, um, can be tricky because they've got screen on them usually. Uh, and so my patio, for instance, has quite a bit of light, but it has trees around it as well. And so those trees are filtering out, you know, it's, it's a nice dappled light, but they're filtering out the light waves that my seedlings need. And so I tend to get really stretched seedlings. And that's a problem because when they start to get their second set of leaves mm -hmm. or when they start to get, um, you know, where they're, where they're growing, um, they get too long and too leggy. And what's, what the problem is, is then um, you will have seeds that, uh, or plants that flap over. Uh, and you, a lot of times you have to start over, okay? Mm -hmm. So you need to find a location. And, and actually you can see these broccoli here. They're, there's chard on the right and then um, some broccoli waltham. Those in that third or fourth row, I'm a little bit concerned about those. They're a little bit leggy um, and they actually germinated first. Uh, they were sitting on my dining room table um, and they germinated first and then I got them um, to their seed location. So um, they may be too leggy in the end. We'll, I'll have to kind of watch them and see. Uh, but at this point, if they do get too leggy, I may have to start over, okay? If I put my seeds outside on the deck where it's nice and sunny, 
Um, just watch for things like rain, because if it, if it rains, you don't have a cover, they'll splash the seeds out and they won't germinate. Um, squirrels tend to like to go through your seeds and steal all of them, okay? Um, you know, wind will knock them over. So you need to find a protected area. And this is something you're just gonna have to play with at your location uh, and try to find the best place. So when I moved to my, my house I'm in now, you know, I took a growing season and said, okay, let's try, a, you know, one here, one here, one here, and find the best location for me. Um, and what I ended up doing is actually getting a light table, <laughs> okay? So um, this is if you're doing a lot. Now, I typically, um, because I'm a Master Gardener volunteer coordinator, um, we've got groups that, you know, we're growing uh, plants for. So we're growing, you know, I'll, I'll grow 720 to 1,000 at a time, which I can do on this table uh, or start on this table. And this is just a shelving system I got from a box store. And those are just shop lights. Uh, and we've hung, so you can buy a system. Uh, they're quite expensive. Uh, this one we made for around $200, uh, two $300. I don't use grow lights because they're expensive, okay? Uh, so I use a, um, each one of those shop lights has a bright and a cool light. And it's the T8, which is a little more energy efficient. And so um, there's actually, there'll be four light bulbs on each shelf unit there. Uh, and and uh, I keep them real close to the, the seeds. Um, they're just a couple of inches above. And then as the plant grows, I will move the light up. Uh, and so those work really well for us. But again, we're doing a large number. Um, if we have anybody on that's from up north, they might have something similar uh, as well if they're trying to start seeds indoor um, when it's you know snowing or cold outside. So for us in Florida, we a lot of times we don't need this, um, but I was finding this this gave me the best success. Um, but a lot of times I'll start seeds just outside on my my deck as well. So either location is fine uh, if you are you know germinating. So let's talk about watering our little guys though. Okay. Uh, so this is important because you can can make or break your little your little plants. Um, so you want an even and consistent moisture. And it, if you're if you're doing it indoors, right? So you've got your trays. And indoors, I'm meaning um, so trays could be in you know outside, but they're they're still in trays. So I should I should put that that's um, indoors. Okay, they're in trays. So you might have them on your deck, but that's still outside. Um, I want you to to bottom water if it's someplace it's protected. So you put a lid on your, your trays, okay? Um, you can use the plastic lids I showed you. You can use, um, one year I've used saran wrap, that worked just fine, okay? Um, so anything to keep that moisture in. But as soon as they germinate, I mean, as, as soon as they come up, that lid comes off. So I don't leave it on there to hold the moisture in. I will let 90% of the tray germinate and then take that lid off because I don't want to, to you know, cause pythium or, or damping off, anything like that. So if you've got a, a tray that doesn't have holes in the bottom um, and it's on like a deck outside, keep an eye on it because they could, they could drown, right? I don't want them to drown. When you put the water in it, it should soak up immediately. So there shouldn't really be water sitting in the tray. Um, but you, if, you, if you let it dry out too much, that water, um, again, the plants will dry out and you either they won't germinate or if they've started coming up, they'll wither and die. So that's probably the most critical time is right when they're germinating and then that first week or two, making sure that that moisture is very constant. I usually um, water twice a week or so uh, because I have a lid and no bottom holes. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll just pick up the tray and I'll, is it heavy? Okay, if it's still heavy, I don't usually water them. And then I will look at the actual soil and I'll kind of poke around a little bit. And if it feels like it's dry, then I'll, I'll water it. The other thing I watch for is um, sometimes in those trays, the edges of your cells will get dry. And so those, you have poor germination on the sides. So sometimes I will have to hand water just on the top of those, um, but just keep an eye on those. If you're direct sowing your seeds, um, a constant even moisture, uh, so we did an irrigation presentation. Oh, it's been several several weeks ago, run, even months maybe. It's on our. Um, you can look it on the YouTube page, but but uh, he goes through the different types of emitters, and it does make a difference. Um, so if you have overhead irrigation, 
for your seeds, that's usually fine as long as nothing's blocking it. Um, and you know, you're not getting heavy downpours where it's washing the seeds away. Uh, if you've got um, something like drip tape, the water is going to be continually coming out. That's fine. But if you've got something like emitters, there's two different types. There's, there's hoses that have emitters spaced evenly. Um, that could be a problem because your seeds may not be next to that where that water is. And if you're in sandy soil, that water tends to go straight down and, and not necessarily out. Um, so in that case, I would make sure you're using, you know, the, the vegetable emitters that um, you can stake and make sure everybody's getting a nice, even um, water. If you've, if you've planted in just rows, okay, you're not using a biointensive method or raised bed and you're doing just traditional kind of rows and they're not very wide, uh, your plants and your soil tend to dry out faster. So that's why a lot of times we'll recommend like a block method where your, your, or your rows are a little bit wider and you've got two or three rows of vegetables in one area because as they grow, they will um, really preserve that moisture, okay? But as babies, they, they will dry out pretty fast. Um, and I know in my area, I would have to water my, my direct sow seeds. Um, I typically water two to three times a day uh, if I can, if it's on a timer, um, because I'll water in the morning. Okay, so first thing in the morning, six, seven, somewhere in there, just to get it nice and moist. Um, by noon, um, and then uh, it's, you know, it's dry. And then by three or four, it's 100 degrees outside. Um, and so I, it, as they get started, I try and, and stagger that watering throughout the day just to get them going. Um, and then I'll back off once they're, they're older. So when do you fertilize? Okay, um, I don't usually fertilize my seedlings until they get a set or two sets of true leaves. So that first set of leaves that come out, those are your cotyledon leaves. Uh, and so those are not true leaves. Once you see that second set, they're gonna look a little bit different. They'll look more like the plant that you're expecting. Um, that's when I will start to fertilize. And you can use a weak solution of like fish emulsion uh, and that would be an organic type product. Or um, if you uh, wanna go with something um, like a, a Peters 202020, that's fine too. Just make sure it's a very weak solution. And I continue to bottom feed. So I will, just like I'm watering, and I, I, it's in place of watering, okay? I'll put it in the bottom of the tray because mine are inside, right? Mine are in a tray. Um, I'll do it that way. If I've got them outside and it's a tray that has holes in it, then of course I'll be using, um, you know, something on the top, I'll be watering from, from the top. Um, and I, I like to use a watering can that's real nice and, and gentle uh, so that I don't, you know, pour water on it and there goes all the little seeds. So uh, it doesn't really matter if you're using fish emulsion or, or liquid, uh, completely up to you. In the garden, uh, I tend to do the same thing. So I'll, I'll wait for them to come up, get about two sets of leaves, and then I'll go out there and start watering with this. Um, and then when they're a little bit older, say transplant size, that's when I'll go out with um, usually my more like my granular or my slow release type fertilizers. Um, and, and it's up to you whether you want to fertilize, you know, throughout the season with with a, uh, a liquid or if you're somebody that that does it two or three times with a granular product, uh, slow release product, that's completely up to you. But at the beginning, the trick is don't burn them. Okay. So a very weak solution is really important. And remember, if you're outside, um, some of that compost material will, will provide some nutrients to, um, to your plants as well. So, so you, you don't need to you know, overdo it if you're planting outside. Okay, so let's talk about successful transplanting. Um, these are zinnia seeds. You can see they're under the light table, but they actually started germinating on the plant. Uh, I happened to look and my seeds were, you know, had, had hung down and so I, I just grabbed the seeds and put them in some soil. Um, but you can see they're starting to get their second set of leaves, some of these larger ones here. And so what I will wait for is I, I will wait for most of my tray to be ready to transplant. Uh, even if they're different varieties, they tend to all kind of be ready at the same time. Um, but I will wait for, for one or two sets of true leaves I want true leaves. And then a lot of times I'll lift up the tray and, and if they've got roots coming out the bottom of their little containers here, uh, then it's definitely time to transplant, okay? 
Uh, and what I do is I will take each little tray um, and I will take a spoon and just gently scoop out that little transplant. You can either put them in a four inch pot, okay, if you're gonna pot up, um, which is typically what we do, but a lot of times we're, you know, we're giving ours away, we're selling them. Um, so we put them in a four inch pot with garden soil or potting soil. Um, or at that point, I could go ahead and put them in the garden. But the trick is, is don't disturb them too much. So you wanna gently scoop them out and then plant them. Plant them at the same depth um, that they were, uh, unless it's something like a tomato, okay, which you could do a little bit lower. Um, if they've been inside, so like mine, for instance, have been you know, in a, at a light table, uh, I will usually harden them off. And what that means is uh, I will take them outside to a semi sunny, shady spot and I'm looking for some place that's a little bit sunnier than, than where they were, um, you know, but still exposed to kind of the elements. But my garden is extremely hot. Uh, I get that terrible after, afternoon sun. So uh, if I just took them from, from this tray and put them directly outside, they tend to not do well. <laughs> okay, so for a couple of days, I'll, I will kind of get them acclimated if I'm gonna take them and put them directly in the garden. Uh, so I do recommend you do that, especially if you had them on like a, a patio or, you know, a deck near a pool or something like that where it's screened. Make sure you're, you're acclimating them to the, the sun, the bright sun. Okay. When I transplant, um, and I do this for my garden, so if I'm putting them in the garden or if I'm putting them in four inch pots, I will mix in fertilizer at that point. So, um, you know, depending on what you want to use, whether you're using a, um, you know, an organic product or um, a synthetic product, that's when I will, will mix it in to where they're going. Uh, I don't want to put too much, but, but enough to get them started. Um, and it does make a huge difference uh, to these plants to really get them going, to add that fertilizer at that point. Um, if you're somebody that wants to continue to fertilize with your liquid uh, and not mix it in the soil, that's fine too. Just make sure that you're doing it frequently enough and you're starting to, to up the rate a little bit, okay? All right, we're right at 11.56. This is my contact information. I had to throw my garden in there with my daughter. So if you have questions, um, and I'm sure we do, because I saw a lot, of, a lot of things going on in the chat. Okay. All right, so Tia, were you monitoring, or Maxine, were you monitoring the chat? And do we have any questions? Hi, Erin, this is Maxine, and yes, T and I have both been monitoring the chat, and I think we have done a pretty good job of answering most of them. Um, Jacqueline asked if there was any need to try to dry out seeds that had been stored in the refrigerator, and um, I answered her and said that I didn't think so as long as they've been stored properly in a sealed container. Right. So, so um, you want to make sure if, um, you know, when you put them in the fridge, they should be cleaned. So, um, you know, a lot of us are saving our seminal pumpkin seeds right now. You wouldn't just take all of that and put them in the fridge. You would clean them. So, you know, I typically will wash mine and then let them dry, then put them in the fridge. So they should be ready to go. Um, you know, I, I let them obviously get to room temperature, but that doesn't take long. Yep. And then um, Damien is a little confused on trays that are being watered from the bottom. Okay. So um, if there's any information there on the physics of how the trays work, um, I let him know that generally those wick from the bottom um, up through the soil. Right, so that's based on capillary action of our soil. Um, and so there is airspace obviously between the, the pores of our soil, but um, just like you would uh, uh, if there were roots there, the plant will actually pull up the, the moisture. So it, it will actually wick up, like Maxine said, um, due to capillary action. Um, and so it, it's a very effective method uh, to water your plants. Um, and you just, again, don't, don't drown them. <laughs> you don't want them floating away, but, uh, but keep enough in there that it'll, it'll wick back up. Um, and uh, it, it just cuts down on your chances of moving diseases around uh, and splashing seeds out. So uh, yeah. And yes, if you need more research on that, there's lots. We can certainly get you some. Okay, somebody asked about perlite in big box stores. Um, usually I have to get perlite at our local um, farm centers. 
So, uh, you know, in, in North Florida, uh, there's a couple that carry it, for instance. Um, it's actually one in, in Jacksonville, and they're pretty big bags. Um, but, but that's where we usually get, uh, and I'm trying to think what the name of the, the store is in Jacksonville. They're, but check your farm centers. Um, that's where you're going to find them. What's my favorite starter soul mix? I will tell you, I, and, and oh, this is only because I like it and I can get it, okay? Um, and I don't feel like I'm spending a, a huge amount of money. Um, I use the SunGrow propagation mix, which is actually, uh, used to be Fafford. Um, the company is called Fafford, uh, and that is a professional mix. I can get it in a really large bag uh, for around $18 uh, at my local farm center. Uh, so. Um, that's what, what I like. Um, oh, good question. Are perlite and vermiculite produced, produced environmentally friendly? Those are both natural products. Um, and so uh, perlite is a volcanic um, byproduct. Uh, so sustainable, I, I have to look at that, but um, they are both natural. Now, again, I don't use them like in the garden. I only use them for closed containers, like soilless media mix. Um, I'm not going to add it to my, my vegetable garden. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm adding compost to my vegetable garden, I do add things like mushroom compost. That's probably my favorite. Um, I just have to watch the PA lev uh, level on that one because it's, um, can be high, uh, in our area at least. Um, so I have to really, my, I do compost, but, um, my compost is not ready. You know, I don't, I don't have enough to do my whole garden. <laughs> so. Uh, let's see, can you recommend the best place to buy seeds? Great question. So I did not, I purposely did not put that on there <laughs> because um, everybody has their own favorite, to be honest. Um, and it depends on what you're purchasing. So I, I will tell you this year I purchased from um, Johnny's, I purchased from Baker Creek, I purchased from um, Southern Seed Exchange, um, I think there's a park seed. I did them as well. Uh, my seed library, um, and then also my friends. <laughs> so, uh, so, so what are your easiest seeds to grow and plant right now? Where are you at? So I will tell you, um, typically we recommend things like radishes are super easy. Um, you can direct sow them, okay? Um, I've started broccoli. I tend to have good luck with broccoli. Um, I tend to have good luck with carrots, but then again, I have a friend that lives down the road and they can't grow carrots to save their life. <laughs> so, um, so it kind of depends on the person, but typically um, grow what you like to eat. Although I will tell you, I, 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 my winter garden looks very pretty, but I don't eat half of what I grow, so I give it away. Um, so, Brad, so if you're in Bradford County, um, yeah, I would, we're getting ready to plant our, our um, radishes, our carrots, um, lettuces soon okay it's still a little warm but this morning was encouraging it felt it felt pretty good outside um i do store all my seeds in the fridge so um going back to the bradford county person check the garden guide and then if you need help um your agent is luke miller at the extension office and um he's a, a great wealth of information so all right, so somebody has several raised beds. They had uh, great, uh, they had great mixture in them. Oh, okay, do you wanna replace the soil before your fall planting? I don't usually replace my raised bed soil mixture. Um, I may add to it, because um, a lot of times my compost will, will kind of, you know, it'll degrade and so it will, will go down. Do you, um, Maxine, do you ever replace yours? Or Tia, do you replace your raised bed garden soil? Sorry. Oops, sorry, I was muted. Um, I do replace mine occasionally, but what I do is make sure that I'm using crop rotation techniques. And then the only time I really replace it is if it just gets so hard and it's been used so many times that the roots and stuff have just got it where it's really hard to penetrate. Um, and then I'll use it and spread it out in my pastures and replace it with some fresh stuff. Sure. So, or if I'm having bad disease problems, with, especially with tomatoes. Yeah, and I would say, you know, if you're, especially if you're new, make sure you're on the Victory Garden group, uh, the Facebook page, um, and then make sure you're, you're in contact um, either with one of us, Tia, Maxine, or myself, um, or your extension agent. So, Tia, you're closer to Broward County. When do you start your lettuce seeds? 
I think she jumped off, Erin. I think she had another um, lunch I, meeting. I would, it needs to be pretty cool. So um, you can try it now, but I would, I would wait a little bit, a um, couple of weeks. Uh, now I do succession planting. That's something I didn't mention, but what I'll do is I'll plant, um, you know, I might plant lettuce this week and then I'll leave some space. And then next week I'll go and I'll plant more lettuce. And then the next week I'll plant a little bit more lettuce so that it's continually producing for me. I try and do um, like my broccoli the same way because it's a, a one cut kind of thing. Um, so I, I, you know, I want to make sure that I'm doing succession planting. Um, but you certainly could try it now. Um, check the guide and see what it says. I'm not as familiar with Broward County down there. I'm trying to think who the agent is down there. I think Bonnie. Um, but I'm always for trying things. Uh, how do we find out who we are in Hillsborough County? Um, who's in Hillsborough? That would be um, Nicole Pinson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's awesome. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, in Hillsborough County, your extension agent would be Nicole. Um, I would go on to the, you can always go on to the, um, you can Google, is usually the easiest way to do. Google UF extension and then your county and that page will come up and there's usually a staff page. Um, and then if you, again, if you don't ever, you know, if for some reason you can't get a hold of that person or whatever, reach out to one of us um, and we will get you in touch with that person or find the information for you. We certainly can do that. Here's the link for all the local extension offices so you can look up your counties. Perfect. Yes, we will certainly share the presentation. Um, I plan on just emailing it out to you guys along with the survey. Um, so, uh, Thank you for, yes. <laughs> Somebody said they like the pick of my garden and my little helper. Yes, she's, now we have chickens, so now we've got lots of helpers. Uh, so. All right, with that, if I, it's 12.06, if we don't have any more questions, um, good luck to everybody. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll see you, see you on the Facebook page if you're, if you're part of our Victory Garden. If not, please join us. Thanks, Erin. Good job. Thank you, Maxine.